very meaningful and purposeful presentations ahead of us. I realized that yesterday three major consensus were broken. And let me begin with what we achieved yesterday, which has a relevance for the session today. The first consensus which was broken yesterday was that we shouldn't be talking about people at the bottom of the pyramid. We should focus on people who are at the bottom of economic pyramid, but not necessarily at the bottom of knowledge pyramid, ethical pyramid, institutional pyramid, innovation pyramid. So somebody who's at the bottom of economic pyramid could be at the top of innovation pyramid. Since language shapes habit of thought, I think it was a great consensus that was broken and something new that came out yesterday from the discussion. Second, it also came out that no more innovations will emerge only within the boundaries of organizations. Innovations would take place across the boundaries. So open innovation platform, collaborative across the formal and informal sector, between the firms, firms and people will become inevitable in times to come. So the classical model of innovation system where we only considered R&D equal to innovation is no more valid. That was another insight which came yesterday. And third issue which was again very important for, for our session today was on inclusiveness in the funding mechanisms. And it was realized that when ideas evolve, become proof of concept, proof of concept becomes prototype, prototype becomes a product, product becomes a utility, utility goes into the market in the form of a company or enterprise. And if you invest only at the last stage, you are really not being very inclusive. So the five stages before the sixth one actually are the ones where major mortality of ideas take place. And it was mentioned yesterday that funds which have to be inclusive have to take a lot of risk. And they can take risk when they operate at early stages. I must make my personal observation here that unfortunately in our country, we don't have really an angel fund which invests in risky enterprises or risky ideas which have not yet proved their merit in the market. So for those ideas which have not yet proved their merit in the market, ecosystem is still weak and I think such funds can go a long way in bridging the gap. So before uh, further, I must also say that today we have in our panel most outstanding people in different fields from different parts of the world. Uh, the way we have decided is that we will take about five to seven minutes for our say, each one of us. We should leave at least 30 minutes at the end for discussion. Uh, I would request colleagues to kindly take their, take their questions, put their questions for the end so that we can have the one round of five to seven minute presentation of each. Uh, there'll be slight change in the sequence because of certain uh, ways in which we are going to present. Uh, we have Ruth Manuel from, who's a manager of Innovations Against Poverty, a Swedish initiative. And I was having a little chat with her before this meeting. Something very interesting that they're trying to do to see how uh, innovations which are attacking the poverty can be supported. Ruth. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here. Uh, Innovations Against Poverty is a challenge fund that was set up by the Swedish government uh, and launched as of April last year. So we are still very much in a learning phase ourselves to see how can we make most of um, the financial support to entrepreneurs, to innovators, uh, to create something where we take, go in and take that risk, not as early as uh, Dr. Gopa would like perhaps in the very, very first stage and during development, but nevertheless at a stage where one hasn't proved its concept yet. Uh, we have set up a fund which can go in and share that risk and share the cost of bringing a solution, an idea to market. And innovation for us does not just mean, we don't talk about innovation as invention or technology, we talk about innovation from a very broad perspective. It might be about products and services that needs to be adapted. It's very important to us to see how can we support innovation and scale up of very good ideas by changing the way they're distributed, changing 
things in retail systems, in franchising, etc. Sometimes innovation here, the very important innovation, is about changing things that are stopping products and services to come to market and is not the product itself, perhaps. So the fund was set up uh, last year and we have uh, a process whereby people can, uh, companies and entrepreneurs, large as well as small, it is open to anyone, it's across sectors, and it's, uh, so anyone can apply to the fund as long as they're addressing the base of the pyramid in a lower middle income country. Of course, what we do find with that limit, an upper limit of the equivalent of 200,000 euro, $250,000, the ones that do apply tend to be very young companies. It tends to be startups, it tend to be um, companies that have existed only for three, four years. We have tried to get the engagement and attention of larger companies as well to see this opportunity, not perhaps for the, uh, to provide the funding as such, but be, be part of the program and share the learnings as well. That is proving much harder to get the attention of uh, established companies and established, and then I, in that respect, I don't mean corporates, large corporates, but SMEs. So the fund has been uh, really successful in, at attracting um, new companies, new entrepreneurial ventures uh, across the world. So we have projects supported in 17 countries at the moment and 40 companies have been uh, supported. And it varies across sectors, agriculture, energy, health care, and so forth. In India specifically, we have uh, so far provided grants to four different ventures and four different companies. Uh, when, when we look at the, uh, the topic here on innovation for the, the bottom or the base of the uh, economic pyramid, uh, what we will find in time is the, we have a certain, of course, because of timing, uh, a disconnect to see the effect, obviously. Uh, when I say we are a grant fund, what we do is to agree with each company, what are the metrics, what are the Im impact you want to see. But we are, in fact, uh, appreciated also by the companies that we leave it very much up to them how they want to perceive their impact in society. We're not a fund that's going to give a lot of, lot of restrictions and a lot of uh, rules about how to do their business. I think that's very one important learning from the, the way we have set up the fund that you should respect the entrepreneur's ideas, you should respect the way they want to operate, the way they want to innovate, to give them as much free hands as possible. Many of them, uh, one of the outsets to have that uh, interaction innovation for the base of the pyramid is of course the way you do research in engagement with local communities. This is where we see perhaps that the Indian entrepreneurs, the Asian entrepreneurs perform perhaps better than many other entrepreneurs. Uh, the Indian entrepreneurs that we have in the fund they take their own, they don't take their own markets for granted, that they understand it, that they understand what the end users need and want. In fact, many of the management team here go out and live in villages while they are creating, while they do the, uh, the development of the services. We see uh, people from other countries not taking that approach perhaps as seriously. You have an idea, you go back home, or you are inventing something uh, very far and then you might test it in the market. So I think there's something very, very interesting happening here, the process that you have, uh, whether that comes from a different educational background, a different attitude or culture, um, we'd like to understand that better because that's something really, really valuable about how Indian and Asian entrepreneurs manage the innovation process uh, to really achieve an innovation which is useful and will be more successful at the base of the pyramid. Uh, so that's something we look forward to understanding better from our counterparts at the table as well. I will uh, stop it there, I think. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Ruth. This is uh, very informative and useful. And the question that you asked about uh, why Indian entrepreneurs uh, do not take markets for granted is a very useful, very powerful insight. Most of them come from lower middle class and middle class. And the way they are brought up, I think it's part of their the upbringing process where they just, they have lived through so much uncertainty. Their parents have lived through so much uncertainties 
that they embed this concern for getting closer to the reality and understanding it, and it's changing so fast. So it's a very interesting insight. I'm sure other colleagues will comment on it. I'll request now uh, Ms. Alexandra Slovia from the UNDP. She's a three country representative, and uh, mm -hmm. the country representative couldn't come, but I'm sure we will get no less rich insight from her about what UNDP thinks on the subject. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to speak on behalf of UNDP India office. And um, as we get gather here today to contribute to this important discussion, how do we and the poor people themselves address the developing challenges? It is, in fact, we cannot address the problems of the poor. Only they can. We are very well familiar with the concept of Professor C.K. Prahalad, Glenn Hubbardine. If we want poverty to decrease, we need businesses to grow and employ more people at the bottom of the economic pyramid and to cater to the needs of the poor. A traditional view is that many market failures and government failures need to be addressed in order to meet the trade-offs of economic efficiency and distributional equity. In reality, however, much more significant transformation is required that is for, with, and by the people themselves. Not only the poor can become, the bottom of the pyramid can become the fastest growing market in the world through innovations that improve affordability of products and tailor them to the needs of the poor. In fact, the poor cease become beneficiaries and targets but become owners and equal players in the market. They need support and a boost to be able to reach that point. There is a growing importance of the bottom of the pyramid for economic growth and beyond, for human development and indeed human progress. Yesterday, our representative Liz Grande spoke about UN big ideas that change the world. One of them being the concept of human development. What I'd like to share with you today is an example of one such concrete innovation that works on the ground uh, here in India. Uh, Swayam. What we propose here is the model of holistic transformation that proves that the three pillars of development, economic, social, and environmental, can and should work together. What is behind this innovation that's developed by UNDP and supported by the IKEA Foundation? Swayam in Sanskrit means by, one, by oneself. It is an initiative to build the abilities, confidence, and power of women to transform their lives and lives of their communities. Since 2009, this has been working in four districts in eastern Uttar Pradesh, and it's being further expanded. Let me start with the social empowerment that builds solidarity and common aspirations among women. Local role models emerge and mindsets start shifting. <coughs> Through active self-help group movement, women have committed to and started implementing the 12-point empowerment charter that commits them to equal status, no discrimination, equal pay for equal work, effective and efficient delivery of government programs and women being, a, being able to access those programs, active participation in Gram Sabha meetings that are local village uh, meetings, exercise their right to vote, equal representation of women and governance at all levels, and promote the girls' health and education. Those are the things women have committed to and are being put in practice. 90% of women in the, the self-help groups come from scheduled castes and other backward castes. And there are more than 3,000 self-help groups active in this area. Moving to economic empowerment, this has led to creation of women-owned and managed producer companies and the emergence of new value chains, leading to significant increase in family incomes in some cases, the family incomes have doubled. Women are trained in managerial and business skills 
focusing on intensive financial literacy and enterprise development, also confidence building, leadership, market, and financial planning. Women are empowered to manage enterprises. They own equity in these companies and they constitute the boards of directors. Women in the village supply inputs to these companies. No middlemen are involved. There are currently five value chains in operation for Berry, Carpet, Crafts, Incense, and Papadam, which is a uh, local snack. There are 35 women linked to these enterprises, supplying enterprises are supplying directly to larger private companies. <coughs> Finally, political and legal empowerment helps women win seats in local elections. Women are redefining local politics and as a result, putting their priorities forward. Panchayat election voter awareness campaigns were launched. Women trained to stand for elections and once selected once they become elected representatives, they know their roles, responsibilities, duties, and authorities. Women are oriented to know their rights and entitlements to be able to make the best use of government schemes and legal aid provided for them. Grievance redressal mechanisms are set up through village monitoring and advisory cells. Before, before this initiative started in 2005, from this area, only five women stood for elections and none was elected. In 2010, however, <coughs> 764 women contested the elections and 278 won the seats in the panchayats. In conclusion, I'd like to share with you some of the challenges and lessons learned from this initiative and this model so far, which is, of course is an ongoing process. The ultimate success is with the link to government schemes and programs, and national ownership, as well as linkages to markets for long-term sustainability. As was already said this morning, women need access to capital in order to set up their own companies, to bear the risk and to invest. Newly established women companies should be linked to buyers, commercial banks, MFIs, business advisory services. The shifting of power equation needs to be handled very carefully, especially relationship with the men. Men also need to be involved in a constructive dialogue for them to play a supportive role. The process of forming institutions of and for poor women should be accelerated. What we have learned also that innovation needs to reach a critical mass, a tipping point to make a difference locally. It needs to be analyzed to allow for adaptation and to be ready for scaling up elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a very interesting story. Uh, many of you might probably not know that in one of the northeastern states, Meghalaya, uh, government is doing some magnificent experiments. They are trying to set up Section 25 companies in each district. And these companies are not corporatizing, corporatizing the administration. So they are trying to have an extraordinary experiment on the direct, in the direction that you mentioned, which is to let people not be the beneficiaries but the equity holders and the participant in the innovation process. So uh, the experiment that you have done to Swayam, in some sense, the spirit of that is getting replicated at the whole state level. This is the first time in a country where the administration is being run through Section 25 companies, not-for-profit companies. It's an amazing experiment that's going on. You also mentioned about how the women groups have achieved income increases and the need for learning and abstracting lessons, and I think couldn't agree more with you. Uh, the basically, the essence of what I learned from your presentation was that poor should not be seen as sink of aid and advice. They should be seen as source of ideas and innovation. So from sink to source is what the underlying ethos is, and I think I would completely agree with that because that is the way forward <coughs> in the direction of development. Next we have is Mr. William Hamnick, Hamming who is the mission director for United States Agency for International Development. And they have been engaging with India 
for a very long time in areas like agriculture, rural development, education, enterprise development, a whole range of areas. And let's see, uh, I'm sure he has some very interesting stories to tell us. Thank you, Anil, and good morning, everybody. I'm truly delighted to be participating in this second Global Innovations Roundtable hosted by the National Innovations Council. As USAID enters its 52nd year in India, India's emergence as a regional and global power and a critical partner to the U.S. in trade and investment creates an opportunity for us to totally evolve our relationship from one away from the traditional donor recipient to, true, to a true partnership across the board, where the United States and India can join forces to advance development, not only in India, but globally. This new approach to partnership and innovation is changing the way we do business. We're looking towards what we call open source, to open source the development process. We recognize that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. At USAID, we're putting this to the test. For example, under this open source development approach, USAID at a global level is creating platforms that connect the world's major development challenges to development problem solvers. With other global partners, USAID has launched a series of grand challenges that have encouraged more than 1,500 innovators, nearly half from developing countries and in fact many from India, to submit groundbreaking proposals for new technologies and approaches to solve a range of global development problems in health, education, and agriculture. We've also launched what we call a Development Innovation Venture Fund, which is very close to what we heard from our Swedish colleague, so that we can help entrepreneurs take creative ideas and evaluate and scale them. In India, USAID recognizes that there's a great opportunity to take this open source development approach to the next level, given that we see India as truly a development innovation hub and laboratory. As we know, India's close to 8% economic growth over the last decade has enabled it to lift millions out of poverty. Modern India's commercial manpower base, its pool of scientists, and its service sectors are globally recognized. Yet many development challenges persist in India, as we heard yesterday as well. According to the 2011 Global Human Development Report, India is home to the world's largest concentration of poor people. Its growing population and increasing scarcity of natural resources combined with escalating demands for improvements in the delivery of basic services compel India with its partners to deliver more value for less cost to more people. As we know, India is already producing homegrown solutions to address many of these challenges, especially to meet the needs of the poor. These frugal solutions are being effectively developed and implemented within a low resource or cost constrained environment, making them extremely attractive as well to other countries. We have a simple equation that we're looking at in, ter in terms of our new strategy. Development innovation plus capital, mainly local capital, plus local partnerships, plus evidence equals development results. I'll just quickly quote from Dr. Raj Shah, who is the administrator of USAID in a recent speech at Aspen Institute. Development is full of competing priorities, but only a few represent significant opportunities to have the greatest impact at the lowest cost. Innovation, partnership, and the inspiration born of local solutions hold the key to achieving unprecedented gains and human health, prosperity, and dignity. During the next years, we will focus on two critical areas. First, on the needs of the population at the base of India's economic pyramid. USAID will collaborate and is collaborating with Indian individuals and organizations to develop, test, and deploy cost-effective solutions that address development challenges in India. We expect to provide seed funding for affordable market-based solutions for the poor that can be scaled through private pathways, but also through non-commercial innovations through public avenues. 
Furthermore, we seek equity in our actions by tapping into the potential of non-English speaking population in India. We continually hear that as we reach out to Indian partners. Second, USAID will support and catalyze the global diffusion of these solutions in order to accelerate development outcomes globally. We're excited to see some of these ideas already being mobilized, and I'll just give you a few examples. Last December, we launched the Millennium Alliance with the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, or FICI, and the Government of India Department of Science and Technology in a partnership. This alliance supports and helps to scale development innovations in some key development sectors, including early grade reading, water and sanitation, family planning and reproductive health, maternal and child health, food security, and clean energy. This Millennium Alliance, under FICI's leadership, brings together social innovators, philanthropic organizations, social venture capitalists, angel investors, and corporate foundations to support innovators with seed funding, networking opportunities, knowledge sharing, and access to capital. The Alliance's first call for proposals in, in India, with a lot of support from FICI actually doing 50 different roadshows across the country, has received a great response with over 650 applications so far. Second, under our development innovation ventures, we're supporting several different game changing potential game changing solutions in, in India. A few, for example, Gram Power, Marigold Power initiatives that aim to operate solar power and microgrids to provide clean, reliable, affordable, and scalable power to underserved populations in rural areas. They're now working in eastern UP, for example. Third, under the All Children Reading Grand Challenge, USAID is supporting five Indian organizations with innovative approaches to test it out to ensure that all children read by age seven. For example, Pratham, one of the awardees, is an Indian nonprofit that is establishing out of school camps to improve early reading skills. And in our interest to really focus on evidence based programming and support for s innovations, in July we partnered with MIT's Poverty Action Lab for a consultation here in Delhi to identify interventions that have proven effective through evidence in promoting early grade reading. We feel strongly India has the opportunity to significantly impact development outcomes, not only in India, but in countries around the world, as proven Indian innovations go beyond borders. USAID India proposes and will partner with Indian organizations to share many of the proven development innovations coming out of these and similar initiatives in India with other countries, trying to tackle similar challenges. So, to, to wrap it up, in India, a middle-income country that is an emerging world leader and a major development innovation hub and laboratory, USAID will continue to work with partners to accelerate innovative changes for the poor and leverage a range of opportunities, resources, partnerships, and innovations that have the potential for development impact in India and globally. We look forward to the discussions here today and to working with many of you as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, there were some powerful messages uh, to just flag a few. The fact that the last decade has had the largest decline in poverty in any decade of the development in the post-independence India deserves to be underlined. The last decade has had the largest de significant decline in the poverty in the last post-independence India. That was the decade most significant. We should never forget that. And the same has led to the decade of innovation, which National Innovation Council is spearheading in the country. So decade of development to decade of innovation is a step forward. You also mentioned about open source development process, extremely important. We believe that a society like ours, emerging economies, must create public goods, knowledge, is, knowledge and innovation public goods. And uh, in, in fact, National Innovation Foundation operationalized a fund just last year called as Grassroots Technological Innovation Acquisition Fund. So we acquire the rights of the innovation by paying innovators some money and then make them available as 
uh, for licensing at no cost or low cost. So this is absolutely important. India plays a lot of importance, not only to create national public goods of knowledge, but also global public goods. India believes that we must share our innovation benefits and outputs with all the other developing countries. The third point that you mentioned about the challenge awards, yes, this again, the NIC had issued a very major call for innovations in gradually reducing technologies and had given awards to six of them. So therefore, this is an area which all the institutions in our country believe very strongly. And uh, the last point that you mentioned about the seed fund, the venture funds, the free angel funds to promote these ideas in different sectors are uh, something that we value a great deal. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Viren Shetty, who will bring to us a remarkable story of blending modern science with the Indian ethos of frugality. High quality with no compromise in quality at very low cost. So Davi Shetty, who, who is a member of National Innovation Council and has set up the Narayan Hidalai, uh, is not here, but, his, uh, but Viren will share with us the marvelous story that this Hidalai has created, a global benchmark in high quality, at least cost, and concern for the health. Sorry, give me a minute while we set this up. Well, you could just start just giving us a little bit of head up on, right. for those of us who don't know. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Viren Shetty. I'm from Narana Hrodialia. Uh, we are the largest low-cost provider of healthcare in uh, India, that is, so far. Oh, good. We have it. All right. Uh, my presentation today is on how to build a $6 million heart hospital. And uh, yes, you just take a moment to read that correctly. Uh, $6 million heart hospital. And just putting the slide up there reminds me of the joke of this bureaucrat who was given this amazing proposal by uh, this businessman. He said, look, we can solve all your water problems your road problems, and look, we've done it. We've done it in this village over here. The bureaucrat looks at him and he says, yes, I know you've done it in practice, but please, can you explain to me how you do this in theory? So I'm going to get into the theory behind a $6 million heart hospital. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to do my MBA from Stanford University, which is, uh, as some of you know, one of the better places to get an MBA. And uh, as interested in healthcare as I am, I thought I'd go and check out their uh, hospital, which is a pioneer in uh, heart surgery in the United States. When I went there, I saw plans for uh, Stanford's project renewal, a $5 billion project that's going to take the next 10 to 15 years to upgrade the existing hospital, as well as destroy the old one. And being the very penny-pinching conservative Indian I am, I said, look, you have a perfectly fine hospital here, why, why break it down? Uh, spending $5 billion would have put up a structure in its place without uh, adding anything to its capacity. And to me, that seemed wasteful. And it also gave me a good appreciation for why healthcare costs so much in that country. And feeling as superior as I was, and I came back home and I wondered, wait a minute, this is a lot of what we're doing in India as well. Uh, this is a picture of my father and me. Uh, in front of the uh, a huge cancer hospital that we both built. It cost a fraction of what the Stanford Hospital would cost, but it's still huge by Indian standards. It's uh, 1,400 beds. We bu built it for around uh, $30 million, uh, equipment and all. And it takes care of the entire gamut of cancer treatments. It's a pioneer. And it really aligns well with uh, Narana's philosophy of de delivering low-cost healthcare by utilizing economies of scale, by bringing specialists from all over the world, and really driving costs and processes wherever we can find them. But by building such a giant hospital, we felt uh, prey to something that I like to call uh, the edifice complex. And the edifice complex is a term I just made up, which, uh, which anyone who's been an empire builder, anyone who's a bureaucrat, anyone who decided that they want to cement their place on this planet by building a giant edifice will understand that. And the edifice complex is the idea that if you want to do something good, you need to build a giant building to do that. And a $6 million hospital is the fight against the edifice complex. This is the 
is a very bad quality picture of uh, a hospital that we are building in Mysore, India. Mysore is a tier two city and it has plenty of uh, specialty heart hospitals. We wanted to pioneer a model of hospital that can be built faster, cheaper, and my slide's gone, uh, without compromising on any of the quality statistics that a uh, hospital of our caliber needs to run. So we tied up with LNT, one of the largest construction companies in India, and we told them, look, it needs to have 300 beds. We cannot spend more than $6 million, and we needed to get, we needed to build it for us in six months. The first thing they did was laugh at us and uh, said, go away, but we persisted, and together this is the kind of hospital we came up with. For those of you familiar with hospitals in the villages, this isn't too far off. Uh, it's a single-story construction. It has uh, just a regular tile roof, but inside, it's actually a pretty sophisticated hospital. What we don't have, though, are uh, marble floors, very expensive art installations, uh, air conditioning, or false ceiling. What we do have are cat labs, MRIs, operating rooms, uh, linear accelerator, and very expensive medical equipment. We really wanted to fight against the notion of building these giant hospitals that need constant air conditioning because for the reality of the majority of patients that come to hospitals like ours, air conditioning is something they're not used to. So we said, why provide it for them when they didn't ask for it? The only places that actually do need sanitation and air conditioning are the ICUs, the, where we keep our expensive medical equipment, and the operating room. And if we can just build the rest of it the way we'd build a normal building, we could save a tremendous amount on costs. That is the, the building is where we're going to save money. Another way we decided to save money was in the delivery of care. We tied up with Stanford again uh, to, uh, to create a patient training program. And the patient training program is our attempt to bring down the cost of manpower. As low cost uh, manpower destination as India is, we in the healthcare business recognize that even with a billion people, we're not going to have enough doctors, nurses, or technicians. We need to start co-opting patient relatives into the training program. So we tied up with Stanford and we said, you create for us a curriculum where in four hours, you would be able to train the patient's spouse to wash his wounds, check his urine output, take his temperature, blood pressure, make sure he does his physiotherapy, and adheres to his medicine while they're in the hospital. And that severely takes off the load from our nurses. And as an added bonus, it ensures the continuity of care so that even after they've been discharged from the hospital, the patient relatives are well trained by our nurses, by the training videos, and through constant practice to be able to take care of them. And this is how we think uh, healthcare has to be done across this country. There are uh, 100 villages across India with a million uh, population. If we were to build a single hospital of this kind and all of that, we could remarkably uh, change the healthcare statistics for a bit. That is my uh, presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I knew his father, but I now know him better. Mm -hmm. Varen has done a great job of communicating the spirit of uh, the enterprise that Narayan Hivele is. Uh, some of the phrases, he, he has a word, way with the words. So he made a phrase which, communicated a phrase which I like very much. He said, penny pinching Indians can't afford to waste resources. Please remember, penny pinching Indians just do work very frugally. How nice. He mentioned that we mobilize, that means Narayan Hirdala mobilizes the expertise from around the world. Another spirit of globalizing India. India does not hesitate in learning from anywhere, seeking resources from anywhere if it comes to delivering the high quality service to the poor. Edifice complex, great. It is such a wonderful idea that when people are not used to AC, why provide them? I mean, they will be in fact shivering and needing blankets when they don't use that at home, they could possibly do without it. Faster, cheaper, efficient. That is the mantra that they have and the six million cost dollar six months building a hospital which delivers services is an amazing achievement by any standard and finally he said we save money by being normal how nice just being normal indian helps you to save the cost 
So it's a remarkable experience. Thank you so much, Viren. We really appreciate it. The next speaker is Rajendra Jagdale from Pune. He has uh, he runs a science and technology park, which is a hub of a lot of innovations taking place in Maharashtra. And they have many, many stories to tell us of how entrepreneurial revolution is taking place in that part of the world. Thank you, Anil. And thank you, Sam, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm specifically focusing on few technologies that can probably change quality of lives of urban as well as rural commons, if I may say so. Uh, I'm going to focus on some likely solutions for just three grand challenges, if I may call them. Affordable and safe drinking water at a doorstep, cooking energy for all, and, sm and smokeless cooking. I'm thinking why I'm focusing on smokeless cooking and affordable housing, very quickly. Uh, Prime Minister of India on 10th January 20, uh, this year, when he released a report on, uh, by hunger and malnutrition, um, he very clearly says that India is shamed by child malnutrition. And according to the report, 42% of children are suffering from malnutrition, which means, which also means that half of the future generation of India is psychologically not healthy. PM also says that policy makers and program implementers need to clearly understand the linkages between education, health, sanitation and hygiene, between drinking water and nutrition. To resolve such problems and problems of this scale, we not only will need disruptive technologies, but also great financial and social engineering. What we need, so on, this is on the scale that is rather be exponential. I would rather call this an exponential innovations. For challenge one and two uh, out of three, women and children health is crucial for eradication and malnutrition. So need for availability of adequate and safe drinking water is needed there, and affordable nutrition supplement needed. I'll show you what experience we have done. We address water issue in different fronts so that water is available, safe water is available at, for every section of society. Safe drinking water when you are mobile, like personal, this is personal drinking water filter, which is like a straw, which, has, which takes care of almost 100% waterborne bacteria and waterborne protozoans. This we have brought for 325 rupees. Similar product elsewhere in the world costs about 3,000 rupees and 325 rupees. If you scale up on a big scale, it f cost can be further brought down. Where India has got many areas where there's no water available in liquid form. So there, this is, we can harvest atmospheric humidity and treat, this is full treatment process within, built within, and provide safe drinking water we have tested this in Rajasthan when humidity falls below 35% and it works. We could produce 12 liters of water per day. Affordable desalination plant, wherever there's a saline water and no uh, other water is available, solar desalination plant, this we have brought down to 27.5 thousand rupees, which can filter 80 liters of salt water and produce about 20 liters of uh, potable water. This is unique experiment. We did for last two years on 25 vehicles. We modified Bajaj three-wheeler vehicle and have full treatment plant fitted on it and st storage tank 500 liters. This vehicle goes to any water around, wells, drainage, anywhere, filters on site. It takes 20 minutes to filter 20, uh, to 500 liters of water and water is door delivered. We are under wrong impression that Indian uh, people from the village, they don't buy water. We were selling this for 10 paise per liter, people didn't buy. We were, buying, we were selling for 50 paise per liter, they're buying. I will not go into the impact. This is the band of women. 100% drivers who are driving this vehicle are women. And they have formed a company under Section 25 
called Sam Siddha. So this is a friend of mine. I sit on his board. He's man behind this initiative, putting his own pers personal funds first. We tied up with membrane filters, a technology uh, took from National Chemical Laboratory, and Innovative is another company who supported this. So we, br we brought an uh, individual entrepreneur and uh, the section of company by women, uh, membrane filter, uh, another company and Innovative brought together and did this. Now, I will not go, I am purposely putting a lot of data on the slide because it could be available to, for your reading later on. I'll just go to, how much would it cost? We have seen that by giving safe drinking water, we can reduce medical treatment costs for a family about, they spend about $40 per year for a family medical treatment. This is our experiment with 17 villages. They spend average about $40 per, per family. That will be, by and large, will be reduced. We have, by considering only 1% of India's population, and if you want to deliver doorstep, doorstep safe drinking water, we'll have to provide, um, we'll provide jobs with this technology and this innovation to about 12,000 people, 400 entrepreneurs, out of which 8,300 will be women. So it can become massive enterprise. So total project cost for, we call it Jaladut as water messenger, mission is expected to be about $100 million, which will cover 400 pilot districts in the state of Maharashtra, and from which the commercial banks, this is so profitable, because we have experience of two years, doing it for two years, commercial banks are willing to contribute 80 million out of 100 million, where now we're looking for 20 million as social equity or maybe um, a margin money. 40% IR, uh, IRR, and with uh, break even within 18 months, if possible. Another, so unless you bring down the, the, the infectious disease load in the villages, you cannot address malnutrition problems. So we focused on bringing down disease load, and then we thought, let's augment nutrition. And six, second stage, age old, we know that Mahatma Gandhi in 1935 had said that we must promote soya bean and soya milk. How much would it cost? I'm, I'm not going to. This is a product that we have already developed. This is a machine which costs seven and a half thousand rupees to manufacture adequate soya milk at a village level fresh. No canning required, no tetra packs required, no market deliveries on a bigger scale required. This can be fresh prepared and delivered every day. What is the cost? One kilogram of soya bean seeds costs 70 cents on the higher side. Highest possible cost in, the, in, in India. Which produces seven liters of soya milk. Add to that some nutrition supplement. We have considered nutrition experts, jaggery and uh, omega-3 fatty acids and other costs and maintenance, everything. Cost per liter comes only 30 cents. So if you feed 100 ml so I have milk per child for three days a week. For f entire year, it costs only $4.5 per child per year. Any poorest father in this country can afford. So it's very, very much possible. So this case takes care of nutrition. And we did this ex experiment with these children here in 70 Anganwadi's preschools. In 70 schools for 10 months, and there's a remar remarkable difference in, in health. Uh, another was, I may be wrong in these figures, I got these figures from somebody, one person dies every two minutes due to indoor air quality, poor air quality. And shockingly, 500,000 lives in India are lost every year because of chronic lung diseases and childhood pneumonia. How do we record this, this? This is a major concern, the conventional cooking. There's an option. Instead of using a wood, you can make a, a agricultural waste, biomass, convert this into pelletizer. This is done by one of our companies. Take any agricultural waste, which is convert this into pellets. These are the pellets. This is the pelletizer that we have des designed. And 
use these pellets for cooking to make a smokeless cooking. This is another, you can have a seven and a half thousand small biogasifier, biomass gasifier at a domestic level. And this, this is that biomass gasifier. Within four minutes, you can generate your gas. This is the gas stove. Just like normal uh, uh, LPG, you can use this and you can have uh, safe smokeless cooking. We did experiment on affordable housing. A lot of experts were put together and we also now have first for rural India, uh, bamboo composite. And the, if you have a square, uh, the round bamboo, then construction becomes difficult. So instead of that, you can have a square by by putting uh, cement and you can construct house in a rural area for about five to six dollars per square foot. So about within, a, within less than a lakh of rupees, you can have almost 300 square foot of house. That takes care of uh, average house is much less, less than, uh, in size than that. So this is what, and this is what we have designed for Haiti. Thank you very much. Let's do something. Wonderful. Rajendra, such a remarkable story of transformation that you have brought out. Uh, I used to talk about factor of 50, which means whatever cost we may have in dollars should be in rupees. You have extended that all logic today. You talked about factor of 100, right? 3,500 to 350. That's a remarkable success in terms of water filter cost. You also highlighted one very crucial point. You know, Indian economic, Indian growth story has a painful side of it. Despite high economic growth, the malnutrition continues to be very high. You know, 50% children in Gujarat are suffering from malnutrition. So is the case in other parts of the country. And you have shown that how at such a low cost, $4.5 a year, you can really solve that problem. So it is in, within our reach. In one year, maybe, we can just take that over this problem. Third thing that you mentioned, now that the Sandy is creating havoc in US, Sam, I think we should export some of the water filtering devices that he showed, the machine that he showed, which can filter um, 500 liters in an hour, that's what he said, 500 liters in an hour. If U.S. government needs 20, that, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 500 liters. If U.S. government needs that, we should gift a few of these filter right away in the coastal U.S. if they want it, because would you be able to supply that? Oh, yes. I'm telling William that we should have to, you know, serve our job, because this is such a great discovery, such a great invention that you have talked about. Uh, indoor pollution and many other things that he mentioned. I think uh, very much, thank, I really appreciate what you have shared with us. This is a remarkable story. We have next speaker, Prashant Biswal, who comes from Selco. Harish Hande at the moment is lighting houses in Ghana and therefore could not be with us. But uh, Prashant will share with us the story of this uh, extraordinary social enterprise from Karnataka where 100,000 or how many households, 140,000 households have been lighted with solar lights and an entrepreneurial model where people either uh, rent in or buy solar lights and make their lives brighter. Prashant. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll just take you through what uh, the journey that Selco has been uh, through in the last uh, 18 years. Uh, Hari started this company um, as a social enterprise in 94 with an objective to provide reliable energy services to the underserved communities. When we started, um, we purposefully started as a for-profit uh, enterprise to make sure that uh, we are accountable to our, to our end users. But we are not very sure uh, how it's going to work, and particularly when you're talking about underserved population who are also um, you know, financially, uh, economically poor, and how do you sell them as you know, solar technology which is perceived to be expensive. Then we look, looked at the uh, um, Green Revolution in India, India, which had created a lot of rural banking infrastructure. And the banks in rural India had created crop-based, cash flow-based financial models. And we just piggybacked on it. The same bank which was financing uh, to a, a paddy farmer or a sugarcane farmer started financing uh, the same farmer to buy, buy a solar lighting system. What we started looking at is three things. One is customized product. We, do, we don't develop technology, but we use technology. How do we customize it based on the need? Number two is how do you create appropriate financial linkage? 
when I say appropriate financial linkage, every end user has a very different need, very different cash flow. So you need to create that appropriate financial mechanism which matches with their cash flow. Number three is service mechanism. We realized in 94, 95, well, solar had a bad name or you know, wherever uh, solar was installed, it didn't work because there was no after self service mechanism. And we created that. So we, we, we told ourselves that we will sell technology only where we have a strong after self service network. In fact, when we started, uh, the, comp the company didn't have enough money to buy product to demonstrate ev in every village. What we started doing is there are a lot of panchayats we, uh, which already had solar street lighting systems. It didn't work. What we did is simply repair them and show, peop show it to people that, look, it works with a little bit of maintenance. So that's how it started. And today we have about 140,000 households in, in the state of Karnataka and neighboring uh, districts in Kerala and Maharashtra and uh, Tamil Nadu which are powered by solar systems. All of them have bought it um, through bank financing, 90-92% uh, of them uh, through bank financing. Uh, coming to innovation, what we have looked at is three things that, that matters. One is technology innovation, though we don't develop technology, we just retrofit them. Number two is financial innovation, then process innovation. I'll just give you quick examples of what we have done so far. Uh, in 2007, we were working with a partner organization which came to us saying that we have a network of midwives who go to villages and help in deliveries. But because there is no electricity in the villages, the delivery is mostly done within a closed house um, which is dark. And the midwife uh, is helping them in delivery which, and, and she has to hold a candle or a torch light, something like that. And we, it just struck to us, you, you have so many um, headlamps, which is either for the biker's headlamp or the miner's cap, which already exist. You just need to retro retrofit it. We just retrofitted it, made it solar powered, and gave it to the villagers. And these midwives actually um, used it. Whenever they don't have delivery, they can rent it out to a mason who works overtime in the evening, or a flower plucker who goes early in the morning to pluck the flowers. And that's how it, it worked. Another thing I'll just give you an example is on the education sector. Now we're talking about digital education. A lot of people are um, bringing computers to schools. But without, without much realization that a lot of schools in rural India doesn't have power. And they come to us, um, uh, this is an example two, two years back, and uh, a school came to us saying, we have some six donated computers um, and we, want to, we don't have power, we would like to run it on solar. Then we, lo we looked at those computers, uh, 240 watt is a conception. You um, design solar, it becomes so, so expensive, it doesn't make sense. I said, look, you don't, uh, do you need six computers or six terminals? I said, yeah, we, we need six terminals where six students can use it. I said, look, there's something called node computing which exists in computing. Get those, one computer, one CPU, six monitors, six uh, keypads, you're done. And you save 70% of the uh, energy per seat per a every user. And then solar makes sense. So th th that's something that we try to do and it's, it's been replicated. Number three, we uh, uh, started looking at uh, students, you know, particularly uh, we know that, you know, the home lighting system that we do uh, are our uh, little bit expensive, uh, those who can, who are uh, extremely under poverty line cannot buy it. And we do not want the students to wait for their parents to buy solar light after five years when they can, because time will be, will be gone for them. So we started looking at a model where students can have access to very affordable lighting systems we, through a very sustainable business model. So we looked at schools as charging stations, where a uh, uh, solar charging station will be there, the light would be at the home, and there'll be a small pocket-sized battery which, will be, which will, be, will be carried by the student to the school, charged in, and taken back home in the evening. And we looked at the midday meal scheme, which has been running successfully in this country. The incentive in the midday meal scheme for the student to come to the school is the food. You don't come to the school, you don't have food. Same thing we applied here, you don't come to the school, you don't have light. So 
that incentive worked out and you know within last uh, eight or nine months we have been able to reach out to over 5,000 students through that model and the students actually pay a subscription fee uh, on an annual basis which goes towards the maintenance of the system. So that, that these are the few innovations that we have been trying to do and uh, not looking at energy as a separate issue but energy um, is a catalyst in all of the uh, if you look at the MDGs development goals everywhere energy plays a role and we're just trying to create that linkage um, and through small innovations thank you this is a remarkable effort that you have made in reaching 140,000 households who are paying who are paying for using solar light we had subsidized this system so long for such a long such so much in the country that it never diffused the moment you withdrew the subsidy it diffused that's one of the important lessons that you have said Technological, financial, and process innovations have to be combined together to make a viable intervention. Another important point, using thin clients to reduce the energy load on the computer system. Such a good idea. So obvious, and yet uh, has not diffused so much. So, and making energy embedded in all other developmental goals that you have is a remarkable story. Now we have with us Bankar Roy, uh, founder of the Barefoot College, one of the most decorated the social entrepreneur of our country and has his feet firmly on the ground. He will share with us his insights about how they are transforming their lives by building entrepreneurs, technicians, uh, self-propelled systems, or engines of growth. Bankar. Yeah. Hello. I'm here because Sam Petroda has blackmailed me into coming and speaking here. Barefoot College started 40 years ago, and I won't talk about the Barefoot College. If anyone wants to uh, know more about it, you can always see the TED talk, which Anil and I have spoken. Why does the Barefoot College innovate? We want to solve the problems of migration. Why people leave rural areas to urban areas, very serious problem. We want to talk, tackle the problems of climate change, very serious problem today. How do we innovate? How does the Barefoot College innovate? We demystify technology. We bring technology right down to the poorest of the poor man or woman. And we only believe after 40 years of experience in the Barefoot College, we believe that men are untrainable, men are ambitious, 